on the Venice Biennale, which is still on, but uh, the event uh, uh, is already that far that we can have uh, a view back. This we do in cooperation with Sabrina Funk, the curator of the Hong Kong Pavilion in Venice. And as this is Hong Kong, we said, okay, first we start in looking ahead. So what's coming up? Next year, 2006, is just a year of preparation, but 2007, the next documenta will come up. You know that um, all that event that takes place in Kassel, um, somewhere in the middle of Germany, and with um, a lot of international audience, we have the curator of the new upcoming documenta here. Uh, and I would like to introduce Ruth Noack to you. We are very pleased and very happy to have you here to tell us about your concept of the upcoming documenta. Um, in the talks before, we saw that there is um, a certain demand to get more to know about what you have in mind with your documenta. I think you will have us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Try to oblige. Um, can you hear me well? Okay. okay. Well, first of all, let me thank you, Mr. Müller Pavan, and let me thank the Goethe Institute. The Goethe Institute is indeed instrumental in documenta. Without the Goethe, we couldn't um, travel the world in such a short time and learn about countries and art scenes and artists that we haven't known before. Um, they've helped us in many places and will continue to do so, I hope. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. I'm here today to tell you um, what Documenta is, and how it became what it is today. Um, many of you might know, and I hope I won't bore you, but then maybe what I'm telling you is also a particular perspective, one that you might not have heard before. Um, this is a post of the first documenta. Um, the first documenta happened in 1955, and it was not called Documenta 1, because at that time no one thought that there would be more than one Documenta. Sorry, I'm just... More than one Documenta. And it was supposed to be um, just one exhibition, but it became so successful in several ways that, um, that it continued on, there was one every four years and then later on every five years and the one in 2007, the one that's coming up will be Documenta 12. They've also just now celebrated their 50 uh, year anniversary and they've put together the Documenta um, team there but in, in Kassel where the Documenta is um, uh, positioned, have put together an exhibition on the history of Documenta so far, and this um, is traveling, I think, some of the Goethe Institutes as well, I don't know what it's coming here, it's quite a good exhibition. If you get to Kassel before um, um, February next year, you'll be able to see it. Well, one thing I want to say um, before um, going into details, and that is, Documenta is not a spectacle of the art world. Though it is considered by many to be the most important exhibition of contemporary art, and it does have influence uh, on what is shown worldwide and influence on the market, um, it really is um, a a, a, an exhibition that has a mass audience as its public. A, an audience of people who are interested in art but who are by no means experts. Who don't go to many other exhibitions of contemporary art. People take um, a day or 
two or three and uh, to learn about the state of the art and they go there very seriously and um, one has to take this public of laymen and laywomen of people who, 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 who are not art world people very seriously. In a way one could say a document is not a spectacle of the art world, it's the creation of the public. Um, this stems from, the, there are several reasons for this. Um, one reason being the building that is housing one of the major parts of document has been um, the building that is fixed there are usually additional buildings as a document has grown that had several buildings each time and more each year but um, this is where it's always housed it's a home and it's called it's a museum called the Friedrichsianum and it was the first public museum in Europe there had been private museums but no public museums it was the first public a museum founded a few years before the French Revolution and founded as a museum of enlightenment. And um, this um, foundational idea is part of the Documenta spirit. Um, the other given of Documenta is the city of Kassel. Um, Kassel is a city that was a worker's city. Um, it used to be a military city, but then it was a worker's city with heavy industry, um, especially um, the Henschelwerke, um, a major weapons factory that manufactured money, uh, locomotives and then also tr um, trucks and um, tanks um, for Nazi Germany. And because of um, this weapons industry, Kassel was almost totally destroyed during World War II and had to be rebuilt and it was rebuilt in the spirit of the new democracy, in the spirit of the Bundesrepublik Deutschland. It was rebuilt as a city for workers um, and it has had um, um, it has had also heavy um, state funding for a long time because it was on the border to East Germany. So in a way it was on the border um, between the West and Western capitalists and the Eastern communist societies and um, the Bundesrepublik um, funded these places at the border. And what happened nowadays, the situation in Kassel nowadays res results in part from this situation because um, when other cities in Germany realized that industrial production wasn't the important thing and uh, was, was, was changing and that workforce wasn't um, going into industrial production anymore be because um, um, the industry went to other places than Germany and, and had to rethink their concept of what to do with their workforce. Kassel left um, a beautiful dream of being state subsidized and did not change and the result now is that we have over 15% of unemployment one of the highest, um, as high in Western Germany, as high as many of the cities that are now in the reunified eastern part of Germany. The foundation of the exhibition, on the one hand, um, the Friedrichsianum, on the other, the heavy destruction of the town is really um, still um, giving an impact. Uh, one could say, the relationship between modernity and violence is a key issue. It will be a key issue of document 12 at least. The first document really was an answer to a fragmented German society. This is a um, drawing from, um, from inception of the Potenzialum. Here you have the ruins of Kassel with the Friedrichsjahren in the back. Can you see it or should we turn off the lights maybe? Is it okay? Can you see the pictures? Okay. So you have the, this is the main place in, in, in the city and you see the Friedrichsjahren has just been left standing, not all, but um, basically most of the other buildings have been totally destroyed. What was
was destroyed was not just buildings. It was um, we were in a situation. The Germans were in a situation um, which they had brought upon themselves um, through genocide and other <coughs> actions um, of being utterly fragmented as a society. Now the question, of course, is how does a society coalesce? And the different ways to form a unity. Um, forming a national myth or a national ideology is one, or just by common interest is another way to form a, a, a unity, a unifying code. Um, but it was not society as such that had been shattered. Um, the relationship between the individual and society also had been um, brought into question, had to be redefined. And the document of 1955 opened a space in which this question, the relationship between individual and society, could be questioned and discussed. And, and one of the reasons it became so important was not just because it brought international art and also art that had been censured by the Nazi Germans, and the so-called degenerate art, and to Germany in an exhibition, but it was also because it created a space for this discussion. So um, it did not really give solutions to these questions, ready answers. Maybe that's something that an art exhibition can never do, um, as it's found, founded on aesthetic experience. But I think uh, if an ex exhibition is successful, it can open up a space in which maybe things can be thought and discussed that cannot be thought and discussed in other situations. How did this space look like? Castle, as you can see, was a heap of rubble destroyed by bom and bombs. And in this situation, um, the government brought the um, so-called Bundesgartenschau there. Bundesgartenschau is, um, is also a, a, is a, um, a show of flowers and trees and gardens that is put up in a city in, to make it more pretty, but also to create and uh, bring infrastructure to the city. So in a way, it's it's, it's something that comes periodically, I don't know how many times, I think every four years or so. And um, there was a Bundesgarten show in Kassel, you can see the poster for it here, in 1955. And um, some guy who was very active there decided, why don't we make part of the Bundesgarten show an exhibition of art? And that was called Documenta, that was the first um, Documenta. Just to show you how they uh, changed the image of the city by the Bundesgartenschau, you can see here the so-called Rosenhügel. It's a, it's a hill of, um, of roses uh, that have been planted on top of the rubble that had been put there from the destroyed houses. So it was a covering up of the rubble, or the rubble is the foundation of this beauty that's today still a beautiful place to walk and be in. Um, so part of this um, this uh, Bundesgarten show was the documenter. Um, but it, um, the, the guy Arnold Bode, who did the first one, had really indeed had a um, very strong and decisive idea. As I said before, he wanted to bring international art to Germany. He brought many, many well-known paintings and so-called masters of modern art to uh, Kassel, but also many works that had not, were not known and that were not um, thought of as masterpieces, and he showed them together, and he showed them without hierarchy. And he showed them in a room. That's um, as a Friedrichsjahn is um, re- um, re um, built and at the time of Documenta it partly didn't have a roof, it didn't have any windows. You couldn't show those pieces of art that was Matisse and, 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 and the castle that, is, that are at the MoMA now, many works that are at the MoMA now, you couldn't have shown those kinds of uh, works in a, such a space today. It wouldn't be possible for conservatory reasons. There were no windows and the floor did not have um, it, there was no floor, it was just sand, and the, as you can see here, the walls were not covered, 
and he used and Borda used materials that you usually use in, in buildings to uh, create spaces on which to hang the art. They were very stark modernist spaces. Here you can see that he hung um, images on plastic. Now you have to know that at that time plastic was a very precious material. It's not as it is now you, um, um, where it's a very cheap material. This was um, quite a, a good material, but at the same time it hadn't been, no one had done this before, to show a work on a surface that's not fixed, and to show work on, on, on a curtain like this. In this ruin, Bode confronted its pub his public with an ethics not just an art, but also um, by, not just because of the art, but also because of the way he showed it, because he showed it without a hierarchy. And he managed through his radical display to move and astonish and overwhelm his public. Um, he created what one critic at the time called the space in time, which has yet, yet to be defined. And he used, um, um, ways like this to put the paintings, to humanize paintings in a way, as he did here. And, um, he used methods like this to really um, pull towards the viewer, to really um, make the viewer get involved in the exhibition. He also completely depoliticized art. But one might um, argue that in 1955, to depoliticize art in the way he did was a step which in turn allowed the public uh, to start imagining a new politics, to take an ethical stance in a way, as uh, Germany had been extremely politicized and its art perception had been totally politicized before, thus for its censorship and destruction of, of works of art. This very serious engagement of a curator um, with the mass audience and with an exhibition in its art has been a defining characteristic of Documenta ever since. And you might also, I might also add that um, one of the reasons why this is possible is, is because. Um, because Documenta has a lot of time to prepare its exhibitions. Other um, continual repeating exhibitions usually don't have as much time. We can really do research and we need to do this in order to learn a lot. And I, we've been touring, the team has been touring um, China for two weeks. Of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg. It's clear that we'll have to return. But it's really been a trip not to choose artists, but a trip to learn and to talk to people, or to look at a lot of work in order to get some kind of feeling for what's going on um, in different places in China. It's very different what's going on in different places in China, and it's very exciting. So part of the success of this documenta was that it really wanted something, not just that it showed what was considered at that time maybe um, the most important work, contemporary work. So it wasn't just its ability to canonize art, but also that all the curators really wanted something, were in a way political curators. Documenta 10, for instance, with Catherine David happened at a time where the market was very um, uh, dominant in the art scene. It was over-dominant. It was a time when a lot of money was washed, so um, people bought art to um, legalize their money, and, um, but that's just one reason. It was a time of huge paintings, and um, uh, Catherine David emphasized and other media and emphasized theory over fetishism. So she actually um, 
influenced uh, the way that um, what the discourse of the time very much. The same happened for Documenta 11. Akvi Ingreso and his team sought to do justice to a globalized post-colonial situation, a situation where there are many places in the world where extremely interesting artistic practices were happening, but these practices were seen globally. They were seen locally, but not, and um, we still had a situation where some people believed that there was a center of art and that the center was Western. Well, after Documenta 11, no one believes this anymore, or at least very stupid people believe so. If you really want to affect something with an exhibition, you have to be very clear about your methods. What is this exhibition supposed to do? What is, is it supposed to mean? Why make an exhibition? The artistic director of Documenta 12, Roger Martin Bergel, and I, and many people who are working with us, uh, want to do two things. They might so sound banal, but they're not. And one is to bring um, a mass audience and cont contemporary art into a meaningful relationship with each other. This is a very hard thing to do. And the second is to do justice to the globalized situation in which art is being created nowadays. It's also a very hard thing to do. Um, if you take art from some, some place very far away and um, put it in some very local place, then it loses its context. And it, in that way, it also loses a lot of what you need in order to decipher it. The problem is that then immediately you create a hierarchy be between the things that are easy to decipher, not because they're universal, but because they're known, and things that are un not easy to decipher. And this is a problem you have to deal with when you're curating. So what these two um, interests entail um, is quite a complex issue, but basically there are two cornerstones in our building of Documenta 12, both of which um, have already been laid by us and will reach from the presence to the exhibition itself. In other words, we're already dealing with things that will influence the exhibition, not just choosing our artworks. One is the Documenta magazine, uh, an integral part of the exhibition, and we have the chief editor of, of this project with us today, and he will um, tell you about this project after my talk. Um, and the second is a series of topics, a set of topics which are, we are using to structure the exhibition and the discussion around the, uh, the exhibition, the discussion with artists, but the, also the discussion with media and the discussion with people in Kassel. This set of topics is not meant to be illustrated by the works of art we're showing. Um, there is going to be a correspondence or a dialogue between the works and these topics. But these topics um, are not chosen just from a philosophical standpoint or a political standpoint. They're chosen um, because we've been looking at art and trying to figure out what might be common interests in different practices around the world. The first one is a question. The question is, is modernity our antiquity? The second one is called bare life. And the third one is education. And we'll tell you a bit more about these three topics now. Is modernity our antiquity? And everyone we've talked to uh, reads this as a different statement because people associate different things with modernity and associate different things with antiquity. And so let me uh, try to define it a bit closer. Uh, what is important to us in, yes, in um, modernity are basically three aspects. The first aspect is the rationalization of all areas of life, the rationalization of production, um, which um, also goes hand in hand with the fresh, uh, French Revolution, the rationalization of a, a system of institutions that govern society, 
and the rationalization of the private sphere. The rationalization of the private sphere goes um, and influences a lot, not just the rationalization of modes of production. Do. Um, you might think of whether or not uh, citizens have a right to childcare, whether or not citizens have a right to abortion, whether or not citizens have a right to have to choose the number of kids they want, just to give examples. This kind of rationalization was really started with a, for at least for the West, for European society with the French Revolution. Um, but it's been happening in different places in, on the earth in different periods of time. So one cannot really, what it means to different areas is, is not the same. It's not a concept that can be historically fixed, um, universal, at least not in a universal sense. For um, European society, um, it can be fixed with, really basically with the French Revolution. And um, one of um, the ways to describe this kind of rationalization has been the disenchantment of the world. The idea that we're not living in paradise anymore. And this, of course, goes hand in hand with the mythification of what it means to be modern. It goes hand in hand with the mythification of what modernity is able to do. Um, the second aspect of modernity that's important is the call for the universal for universal rights, for universal standards, for universal norms. This has been heavily criticized and rightly criticized in post-modernity because if you have a hegemony of, of cultures, of states, then who gets to decide what the standards are, what the rights are, are of course dominant powers. On the other hand, um, it might be a time now where we can think of the universal again, not as something that's given, not as a set of standards that's fixed, but maybe as something that we should try to make, to, to, to try to, as something that we need on a planetary um, um, horizon, as something that we need in order to save the world. The third aspect of modernity is the realization that there is, in fact, radical contingency. Radical contingency is a very simple concept. It just means that the science and the things that they signify do not have any essential connection with each other, not, no normal connection. In language, this is obvious. Um, a cow means and a coo means something else in every different language. So even though you have the same thing, it means something else. So in a way, the, uh, the words do not adhere to the things they signify. And this radical contingency is not just a question of language. In aesthetic terms, it was quite important, this realization it came about with, um, with modernity. And it created a debate on form. The whole formalism of modernism has to do with the realization of radical contingency. So modernism in a way is an aesthetics that tries to um, deal with issues of modernity. In psychosocial uh, terms, the radical contingency goes hand in hand with alienation. Marx has um, theorized on this, um, this situation where um, there is no unity anymore between the craftsperson and the product. In political terms, one could, and this is just an example of many, one could argue that, for instance, um, the dissolution between the individual and national identity is a form of radical contingency. National identity does not necessarily adhere to the individual anymore. There are people without citizenship, and also in situations of war, for instance, this becomes clear that this is not the same. To be an individual um, does not mean the same as to be a German. What now do we mean by antiquity? We don't mean a specific historical period. But those elements in the past on which contemporary society is based, these elements on which our societies are based, 
are at the, are at the same time inaccessible and undecipherable. They're inaccessible because, they're sh because um, through the traumatas of modern life, the war, the genocide, and, every, and, and similar things, um, they're somehow shattered. We cannot have an easy relationship with our past. This is not possible. They're undecipherable because there's no direct connection up to the past. And the image of people in ruins trying to excavate things that make sense of early societies is just one image for this. So one could speak of a riddle of modernity. And uh, one could also say that artists, or many artists, are searching for the whole building plan of modernity. Not always successful, because maybe that's not possible to find it. Um, we're searching for answers to questions like these. How is it possible that a political system which is organized, is organized to, um, to benefit people, to do good, to take care of its populace, um, is at the same time practicing genocide? How is that possible? How can such a uh, thing that um, happen? And it's happened not just during the Nazi time, it's, and it's not just limited to, to one nation. We all know situations where the greater good seems to enable a nation to do um, violence to its individual citizens. And it seems obvious that this is not a question of capitalism or communism. One might also argue that um, because of the experience of violence, our culture is inscribed with an ethical need to realize a universal horizon, or to put it plainly to learn how to talk to each other, to understand each other, and to live together. So that's um, our take on modernity and antiquity. Now when we started researching uh, for documenta, we found that really all over the world artists are interested in modernity, not just in modernism. Um, but uh, for the better art, artists' practice and better works, um, this is not a naive relationship. This is exactly a difficult relationship. The second um, topic I mentioned was bare life, naked life. Um, lots has been talked about um, in the European and US American context about this concept, which has been made popular again um, via um, a philosopher called Giorgio Agamben, but um, also has been um, theorized by a German philosopher, Walter Benjamin, a philosopher of the 20s and 30s. Um, but it's a concept that's much older, it comes from Aristotle. Um, and what he's describing, he's making um, a, a difference between two concepts of life, between Zoe and Bios. And it's a difference between life with a political function, um, and function can be to lead a good life, well, to be have a position in society. It doesn't mean you just have to, you, you, you are politically active, it means to have a function in society. And life, and in a state of indeterminacy, and in other words, existence as such. Life is pure, bare existence. Existence as such is a difficult concept for Westerners to grasp. I've come across in discussions with Chinese artists, I found that it seemed easier for the Chinese um, uh, people to deal with this because it's part of their tradition, or your tradition. And also because the um, the fear to be essentialist is not is seems to be a problem of the West, basically. And a very smart gay uh, person once said, maybe essentialism is something that we have to risk. We don't have to want, like it, but maybe it's something that we have to risk when we think about subjectivity. Existence is such. Existence as such can mean different things. It can mean a light stripped of its 
a life stripped of its political rights, of its human rights. Um, it's um, if you want to throw people in prison camps, if you if you want to engage in war, if you want to um, um, commit acts of totalitarianism, you cannot do so without stripping people of their rights and making reducing them to their life. Um, but it also has a positive aspect. Um, its existence as such also implies continuity, implies um, the breaking down of boundaries between life and death, between being spirited and dispirited, <coughs> between being free and fixed. It opens up uh, possibilities, it also open has a lyrical aspect that is very important to us. Um, what is important to know that um, um, in differentiation to Aristotle and also Agamben, we don't think that this um, difference between Zoe and Bios, between life with a political function and bare life, is really so um, easily drawn. We think that between those two there are many fuzzy areas. There's rather continuity between these. The third and last topic um, is education. In German, education is called Bildung, and Bildung has a double meaning. Uh, it means, on the one hand, education as enlightenment, as acquiring knowledge, um, as in learning to learn. And in, on the other hand, it means forming something, building a form or a cluster. And, um, our take on education is first and foremost as uh, education is a form to build a public. Um, education is a general issue of a public life and it's been discussed a lot in Euro over in Europe where it seems that all the educational systems are not working functioning properly anymore and universities are being um, uh, are lacking many funds um, and schools are not um, functioning even to the point where, people, where where small children who go to school do not learn to read or write, which is a very strange thing that we found out in the past five years that one wouldn't, we wouldn't ourselves have associated with a welfare state. So this um, the, the function of education and how it's supposed to work has been discussed a lot in the context of European uh, societies, but it's not just uh, a question that is important to uh, uh, or focus on that. It's important all over the place. Um, how does education function, and how um, how can we create and sustain a civil society? It's quite obvious that we cannot sustain a civil society without education and that we need institutions of education. And the museum has been one of these institutions of education. And the museum is also in a crisis all over the world. Even though I know in China there are a lot of museums being built in the entrepreneurial uh, phase. Um, but the question also is, are they just being built or are they funded adequately? And are, is research and um, taking care of works of art being funded adequately? Or is, um, are these just exhibition halls? And uh, we have a responsibility to d deal with these issues because Documenta has never conceived of itself as an exhibition as such. It's always conceived of itself as a museum, a museum for 100 days. That's one of its motto. So it has to deal with, th with more than creating a spectacle. It has to take its public seriously. And there is, of course, when you show contemporary art, a specific problem of public. And that is how to understand the works. Unless you're an expert, it's extremely difficult to understand works of contemporary art because um, it's a very specific and specialized discourse. Um, as a curator, you don't want to be too didactic, that's extremely boring, uh, but you also don't want to fetishize the work. Fetishizing the work means to just put it up and let the people 
um, create an aura around it and let the people just deal with the fact that they don't know how to deal with it and um, leave them alone in the situation and then just uh, hope that people will just um, identify with the work without understanding it. But that's a very passive position for an audience and we're interested in creating a more active audience. And actually the aura of, of a work of art can help. It can help to, and, and help to um, create a situation where it's possible for a public to learn something about a work without having the need to consume it, without having the need to fully own it, without having the need to um, incorporate it. Um, this is possible because actually the aesthetic experience, that is what happens with the work of art and the viewer, is one that cannot, does not have a final meaning. Final meaning escapes this process of an aesthetic experience. And um, to me, a good exhibition is one that does not frame the artwork in, by um, fixing its meaning, but actually one that makes a point, but at the same time lets each individual, individual artwork breathe and lets it um, develop this, um, this autonomous quality, this, this, um, this um, character of not being fixed in meaning. And if we're very, very lucky, I don't know whether we'll be able to make such a good exhibition. If we're very, very lucky, the audience of Documentary 12 will indeed become more than a view viewers, they will become a public. One that reaches beyond the borders of one nation towards a future of planetary understanding. Thank you very much.